So, what happened here? Did you see the car drive onto the ice? Did you see it go through the ice? Did you see the person get out of the vehicle? Was it an accident? Was it a homicide and the body's still in the car? Was it an attempted suicide? We don't really know, do we? And that's the thing. We weren't there to see it. What we're left with are the remnants of the activity of interest, and we have to piece those together to try to make sense out of what happened. When I teach forensic science, I teach it as a historical science, like archaeology, paleontology, or geology. And that's because we're all doing the same thing. We're all taking what's left over from events we're interested in and trying to put them back together and make sense of them to reconstruct past events. We're trying to make the absent present, in a sense. All of these sciences center around, sort of start from, a novel written by Voltaire about a character named Zadig. And the book is called The Book of Fate. And Zadig is a wanderer, and he's walking through the woods one day, and uh, some of the queen's retainers burst up and, uh, through the trees and see him and say, have you seen the queen's dog? And he says, small spaniel, long ears, just had puppies, limp in the left front paw. Yeah, that's it. Have you seen it? I didn't even know a queen had a dog. Then some of the king's staff burst through the trees looking for the king's prized stallion that's missing. And Zadig says, excellent galloper, small hooves, about five feet tall, tail about three and a half feet long, gold on the bridle, silver shoes. They're like, exactly. Which way did it go? No, I haven't seen any horses today. So they immediately assume that he's lying and that he's a thief, and they arrest him, and they drag him in front of a judge. And Zadig explains his methodology, which I will do to you, um, and he's released and has other adventures in the book. But this is important because this is the first written example of what we could call a forensic philosophy. And that's important because forensic science, even though it's critical to our criminal justice system, doesn't have an overarching philosophy. It doesn't have a guiding set of principles. And that's important. Thomas Kuhn said that one of the things that differentiates science from pseudoscience is an internal corrective mechanism. That is the ability to spot your errors, correct them, and make sure they don't happen again. And that's what forensic science needs. What we do is we construct, reconstruct past criminal events, right? That's what we're using uh, our, our abilities for. Now, we don't get a perfect picture. We don't get uh, the name and address <laughs> of the, of the uh, assailant. What we get are, as Freud notes, slight and obscure traces. And those are what we have to put together. And the burden is on us to be able to interpret those accurately because lives are at stake. Georges Cuvier, who is the pioneer of paleontology, the study of fossils, um, used proxy data to develop what he referred to as the principle of correlation of parts. And what that means is, if we find a fossil and it has large canines, sharp teeth, we can assume that it's a carnivore and that the rest of the body will follow suit. Cuvier's principle is based on uh, interrelated elements of a system. So big teeth means a carnivore and the rest of the body will look like a carnivore. In forensic science, we do this routinely. We see a fingerprint, we assume there's a finger, and behind the finger is a person. That happens all the time, but we don't think about it like that. Another example that we use in forensic science, uh, borrowed from geology, that we don't know that we borrowed from geology, is called uniformitarianism. And that's a big word that simply means that natural phenomena do not change in scope, intensity, or effect over time way to paraphrase that is that the present is the key to the past. And what that means is if we look and see how volcanoes act today and the type of information that they produce today, then what we're doing is seeing that process in action and we can apply that to the interpretation of volcanoes that erupted 200 years ago, 200 million years ago. It doesn't matter. We can, we can make these interpretations almost out without regard to time. In forensic science, we do the same thing. We test fire bullets on the range today, and we compare those to bullets from the crime scene two days, 
two weeks, two months, two years ago. Again, we can make these comparisons almost without regard to time. Now, another principle that we borrow um, from geology without really knowing it is called the principle of superpositioning. Again, a big word. All that means is younger stuff is on top, older stuff is on the bottom. As you can see in this picture of Sidling Hill from Maryland, I used to drive past there all the time and always thought it was a great example. You can see that the older layers of rock are below the younger layers which are on top. This only makes sense. If I spill coffee on a napkin, the napkin was there first, otherwise the coffee couldn't be spilled on it. So the napkin's slightly older than the coffee, even if only by a second or so. Likewise, at a crime scene, when blood is shed, the surface it lands on had to be there first. Otherwise, the blood couldn't be shed on top of it. Now, you might be thinking, wow, that's a really simple idea. But crime scenes are complex environments. And many crime scenes have been misinterpreted for a lack of knowledge about simple procedures like this. Another one that we borrow from uh, geology is called the principle of lateral continuity. And that means that materials in a layer are continuous until an object interrupts them. So, like cutting a cake, for example. Now in forensic science, we use the principle of lateral continuity in a couple of ways. One, for example, let's say there's a broken pane of glass from a window, and we can fit it back together like a puzzle. That tells us, if we can do that, that that piece of glass was at one time a continuous piece of glass. Lateral continuity. We can also do this with evidence that's transferred between an assailant and a victim during an assault. So the, the fibers that are transferred between the two individuals, if they had no prior contact, are taken as indications of lateral continuity during that assault. And the more fibers we find, and the more different kinds of fibers we find, strengthen our interpretation of that lateral continuity. And finally, we have absolute and relative chronology. Relative chronology is simply saying one thing is older or younger than another. Pretty straightforward. Absolute chronology is affixing a date or a time, some quantitative value, to an event. So for example, in forensic science, if we find a receipt from a hardware store for a shovel and a, bag of tra or a box of trash bags and some duct tape, and it's dated the day before we find the victim bagged, taped, and buried, we call that a clue. That, in fact, happened in one of my cases. Um, but using, using those, those measures in forensic science are important, and yet we don't think of them that way. I would be remiss talking only about borrowed uh, principles without talking about one that comes from forensic science itself. Edmund Locard, who created the world's first forensic laboratory in Lyon, France in 1914, developed this notion that now bears his name. The Locard exchange principle states that when two objects come into contact, information is exchanged. Pretty straightforward. You're wearing boots, you step in the mud, you get mud on your boots. You step on the floor, you get mud on the floor, you get yelled at. You have tread on the boots, that gets transferred to the mud as an impression. Again, pretty straightforward. But it's the central notion that powers forensic science. The only problem is one principle isn't enough, and I'll explain why. There are almost 2,200 people who have been wrongfully convicted and were exonerated. Those are just the ones we know about. Many of those people were wrongfully convicted based on erroneous notions of forensic science. Their lives and their liberties were taken from them. What we need is that internal corrective mechanism. We need a set of guiding principles, a guiding philosophy to forensic science. We, as a discipline, need to author our tomorrow so that we can prevent future wrongful convictions and allow innocent people to write, to author their own tomorrows. Thank you.